Uh, so the title for the sermon this evening is The Order of Government. The Order of Government. And so we're continuing our Decently and In Order series. And so we've looked at the order of the workplace or the employment, the order of the family. Now we're looking at the order of government. There's also the other institution that we're going to be looking at uh, after government is the local church, the, the order of the, of the church, the local church. But when I think about all the institutions that I could possibly preach on, this one is probably the most controversial. Like this one is probably the one that's going to be the hardest for you to swallow because we have a corrupt government. We know we have wicked politicians. And look, I can't, I can't think of a single nation on this earth which has a righteous government. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I, I just, I mean, maybe, maybe some of those African countries where they're still putting homosexuals to death. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's some righteousness in those places. And, but you know, when it comes to preaching on a topic that's not going to be popular, you know, we've also been going through, through Jeremiah, right? And, and we saw in Jeremiah that the prophets of the land were like wind. Right? So when it comes to preaching on governments, you cannot, you can, you, you can, I can be like wind. Like we can have, we can, we can do this today if we want. Right? I can just be, all right, we're going to be listening to our, from our pastor today. You know, there it is. You know, there's the preaching. You know, hopefully it blows nicely on you. There's a bit of wind. Now it's refreshing. Oh, you want some hard preaching? Let's put this on, on, on number three. Let's put a high set in there. You want some, you want some hard preaching? We could, hey, hey, many, hey, that's what a lot of churches are like. Right? You can sit down and listen to this kind of stuff and you walk away with no knowledge, not being confronted with anything. Or, you know, you can want to hear from the Word of God, which is sometimes unpopular. And uh, so be it. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach to you what the Bible tells us about the government. And, uh, you know, really, uh, we have to understand that government is an institution that God created. I'm not saying that the politicians are righteous. I'm not saying that our politicians fear God. In fact, I know they don't fear God. What I'm saying is that the power, the institution, is one that God desires on this earth. Now, we've looked at Genesis chapter 4. Let's look at Genesis chapter 4, verse number 8. Genesis chapter 4 and verse number 8. It says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So we have the first murder that takes place. It didn't take very long between two brothers there. And then verse number 9, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which have opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Now listen, we know what the punishment of murder is. You know, as the Lord God gives his laws to Moses, what is the punishment for murder? Anyone want to give me the answer? The death penalty. Cain is saying, he's not even being put to death. He's saying, my punishment is too much to bear. Hey, we can see what happens to a society that does not have governing authorities, you know, punishing crime. Okay? Now let's keep going there. Verse 14. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So you can see here that Cain recognizes that within the nature of a man, they desire to put a murderer to death. He says, Lord, as I go about, you know, don't forget, this is one family that's on this earth, okay? The, you know, it's uncles, uh, sorry, it's not uncles, it's brothers and sisters, it's nephews that would want to seek to kill Cain. I'm sure Abel was a great uncle. I'm sure he was a great brother and sister, right? I'm sure he was, he was a great family member. And he says, look, it's going to be within the natural instinct of the man, God, to put me to death. And that is correct. The natural instinct for a murder, you know, uh, the, the natural instinct to make sure that the, pri the crime is punished for a murderer is to be put to death. All right. So even Cain recognizes this. Verse number 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And so God puts a law in place. If you kill Cain, it's going to be seven times worse for you. The punishment is going to be seven times worse for you than it was for Cain. All right. Now let's drop down to verse number 23. So we're dealing with a society 
without a government at this point in time. We're dealing with a society which is one main family, of course. You know, the children being born and the descendants being born. We, we saw this as Genesis chapter 4 was being written. We saw this, this family line c- come into be. Well, we drop down a little bit further into history in Genesis chapter 4 verse 23. It says here, And Lamech said unto his wives, so Lamech takes two women as wives, Ada and Zillah. He says, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. So within the same chapter, we now have the second murder that takes place, all right, on the land. And here we have this man Lamech, he murdered a man. But then he says this, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. So, you know, Lamech, you know, puts this upon himself, says, look, if God did not want Cain to be killed, and he put this judgment of it's going to be seven times worse, well, surely for me, it's going to be better for me than he was for Cain. And, and if anyone slays me, it's going to be 70 times seven times, you know, worse for that person. What do we find in here? Are, are people taking the punishment seriously that, cut, that fell upon Cain? You can see that uh, by Cain, uh, uh, you know, living his life and, and not being punished to death, that others will use that example of Cain and say, well, if he can kind of get away with murder, then surely I can. I'm a better person than Cain. And so, look, you know, we know the story of Genesis. Things get worse and worse. You know, it begins with murder, but the people become more and more corrupt. And if we can now go to Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 5, we don't get too far into the story of human history and we learn in Genesis chapter 6 that God wanted to destroy the earth with a flood. You know, the, the people that had become so wicked in the eyes of God. He says, ah, you know, I'm done with these people. And, and God seeks to destroy the entire earth. Genesis chapter 6 verse number 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and he grieved him at his heart. By the way, this is the first time we see the term repentance uh, in the Bible. And who repents? God repents. Can repentance be a turning from sin? Well, if repentance is a turning from sin, you are saying that God turned from his sin. Hey, God cannot sin. God is righteous. God is holy. God is without sin. And that is a separate topic. But anyway, what we see here is that God changed his mind. He created man on this earth, and then he became exceedingly wicked. Now he repents from making that. He says, now I'm going to destroy them. And we know the story of the flood. Let's drop down to verse number 11, same chapter, Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So you can see how when someone gets away with murder, and then someone else gets away with murder, before you know it, the entire world is corrupt. You know, when there isn't proper punishment for for crimes, people are going to think they can get away with it. The entire world will be filled with violence. The entire world will be corrupted in the eyes of God. And so therefore God, of course, sends his flood and Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord, and Noah and his family were saved by the flood. Let's go to Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 5. Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 5. So when uh, Noah comes off the ark, okay, we see that God institutes government for the very first time. Okay? Now, before I read Genesis chapter 9, verse number 5, let me just read to you what the definition of government is. Just I found the very most basic definition on the internet. Definition, it says, the group of people with the authority to govern a country or state, in particular ministry in office. Okay, So it's a group of people with the authority to govern a country or state. And so when we think about all these different institutions, and we saw that every institution has a leader and people under that, uh, the government would be the, the biggest institution. It's the biggest uh, God-ordained you know, institution on this earth. Of course, you know, uh, we have the family institution. You know, one single family is not going to be as large as an entire nation, right? Uh, and, and one workplace is not going to be as large in, as an entire nation. And so this is by far the biggest, the biggest institution that God ordains. And because it's governing an entire nation, this is where people can have authority over other 
people on the land, right? In your family, your authority as husbands and, and as fathers is under your family unit. You do not have authority that stretches beyond those boundaries. You know, me as a church, a church pastor, I have authority in this church. I, do not, I, I cannot go beyond those bounds. I don't have authority in your home life or, or in some other church. But the government has authority over the entire nation, the entire states that falls under that jurisdiction. And in Genesis chapter 9, verse number 5, as soon as you know, God you know, takes uh, Noah off the ark, he puts some new laws into place. And these laws are dealing with murder. These laws are dealing with what happens if you kill a man. Genesis 9, 5 says, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So what is God saying here? God is saying, if someone murders a man, his life is required. He will be put to death by man. God even says, if a, if a beast, if an animal kills a man, then by the hand of man, that animal should be put to death. Listen, you know, if, if some pit bull, you know, some pet pit bull dog, you know, kills a human being, that animal needs to be put to death. Okay, it's not an argument. This is the law of God. But also... If a man kills a man, murders a man, I'm not talking about uh, you know, uh, you know, warfare at this point in time. I'm just talking about killing someone in cold blood. All right, That person deserves to be put to death. This is where government steps in. We have now a, a law, you have an authority that governs the entire world. All right, This isn't just for Noah's family. Of course, I guess everybody's Noah's family. I guess when you think about it, right? We all come from Noah at the end of the day. But this is covering the entire world. This is covering the nation. And so the first uh, law that was put into the hand of governments was the death penalty. Okay, now our, our nation, do we have the death penalty? No. no. I mean, even for the most exceedingly wicked crimes, we do not have the death penalty. And so is our government carrying forth the instruction that God gave them to do? Not at all. Okay, not at all. So I don't debate with you that we have a corrupt government. I don't debate with you that we have a government that has no fear of God. I agree with all that. I agree. Okay. But I just want to show you that the reason government was put in place is because we require law and order. Our society requires law and order. I wish we could all just be saved and have a fear of God. And, you know, we didn't need a, need a government. But we can see here what happens in history when people become corrupt and wicked. You know, the entire world becomes, you know, corrupt, out of control. You know, to the point where God desires to destroy it. And the way God would manage this moving forward is by putting government into place. All right. So now let's go to Exodus 22. Let's go to Exodus 22. Because it's not just the death penalty that the government has been given power to do on the land. Okay. It's not just a death penalty. And I realize what I'm about to teach you, some of you guys are going to disagree with me. All right. Now... How do I know what powers God has given a government? How do we know this? Well, we know this because of the Word of God, right? And God, when uh, the Israelites left Egypt, when, they, when, the, when the Exodus took place, God had a new nation in His hands, all right? And God gave Moses the first five books. Those first five books are known as the Law of Moses, right? The books of Moses. And it's by these first five books that the nation of Israel was to be governed, Okay, I don't think anybody really debates that, right? The first five books is how the nation was to be governed, right? And within those first five books, God gives powers to the governing authorities of how to deal with situations within that land, within that nation. Now listen, God does not have a uh, covenant with Australia. He does not have a covenant with the United States. He does not have a covenant with the modern wicked nation of Israel. Okay, he does not have a covenant with China. God does not have a covenant with his nations in the way that God had a covenant with Israel. But if you know your Old Testament, you know that God will look at the wickedness of other nations and he would judge those nations based on their uh, behavior. You know? In fact, God will sometimes reward certain nations if they were doing well. All right? And God would judge them if they were doing wickedly. So even though we, we don't have, you know, in the same way, uh, you know, uh, 
You know, God's not dealing with Australia the same way that God was dealing with that physical nation of Israel. We still see with the first five books of Moses what powers God gave governing authorities to govern a nation. Okay? And so if this is how God feels about a nation and the government, then this is how we ought to understand how God views our government. All right? And what powers He's given our governing authorities. Now, let me be the first to say to you that our government has powers that God did not give them. Okay, they, they do practice certain powers that God has not given them. Okay, I'm not going to be focused on that today so much. Lord willing, if I cover, continue this topic on Sunday afternoon, I'm going to teach you how we, how we deal with a government, government that is practicing a power that God did not give them. But let's learn as to what God did give them, and so we can understand what, how, you know, whether we should obey, whether we should allow ourselves to be subject unto the powers that are over us. Now, in Exodus 22, verse number 1, the Bible reads, If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So what do we see there? God puts laws for theft. Okay? So the first power that we're going to look at here that God has given a government is to punish crime. It's not just a death penalty. Yes, that's one way to punish crime, but it's also theft. Okay, to punish crime. Verse number two, if a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. We saw that if someone commits murder, they are to be put to death. But if, if a thief breaks into your house and he dies, right, then no blood will be required of him. But let's see, going verse number three, if the sun be risen upon him, that's if it's daytime, there shall be no blood shed for him. For he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Okay, so if someone breaks into your house in the middle of the night, and you've got a wife and kids, and you get into a scuffle, and you end up killing that man, God says, well, that's fine. That's his punishment, right? That's his punishment for trying to break in in the middle of the night. You don't know what that guy's up to, okay? And you may very well end up killing that man. But if it's during the day, okay, if it's during the day, then death is not the punishment that he should receive. He should restore what he had taken in his hand. Okay? I don't want to go into all the detail. I just want to show you the powers that God has given government. So it's to punish crime. Let's go, drop down to verse number 18. Exodus 22, verse 18. Now understand, every time we transgress the law of God, we are committing sins. Some sins are crimes to be punished by the government. But other sins are not crimes in, the, in that way. Okay? But look at verse number 18. Exodus 22 verse 18. It says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Okay? So what's supposed to happen to her? To die. right? Someone that is practicing magic, okay? someone that is doing witchcraft, they are to be put to death. We see that again, that God is confirming the death penalty for crimes. Witchcraft is a crime okay, in the eyes of God. Verse number 19. Whosoever life with a beast shall surely be put to death. So bestiality. I don't want to go into all that. But that is something somebody would be put to death about. Okay? Now we're not going to go for every crime. I just want to give you a flavor. But we, what we see here is that God has given government the authority to punish criminals. Okay? There ought to be just punishment for crimes against uh, the Lord and against the nation. Alright, you're in Exodus 22. Let's go to verse number 16. Exodus 22, verse number 16. Another power that God has given government is to authorize marriage and divorce. Now, this is why it's important because some three years ago, our nation changed marriage laws, right? And so our nation today allows same-sex marriage, okay? All allows sodomites to get married, All allows these people to have a marriage license, and of course, that is not true marriage anyway, right? Because God's put a certain uh, you know, definition of what marriage is. That's one man, one woman for life. And so, you know, what happened was in 2017, and I had many discussions with different people, and said, well, if Australia recognizes now same-sex marriage, then, you know, when, when I find a wife, I'm not going to get legally married. You know, Pastor Kevin, I just want to come to church with my wife-to-be, and we just want to have a church marriage, whatever that means, right? We just want to have a church marriage. We don't want to even tell the government that we're getting married. That's not quite right. Because God has given government. Again, these laws were to govern the nation. Okay? 
God has given uh, the government the, the right to authorize marriage. They say, but they've authorized homosexual. Yeah, but that's not marriage. Like, we know God's word. Like, we're not going to be deceived. You know, just because uh, two homosexuals receive a marriage license by our nation, it's still not marriage to me. I don't care what they call it. Because I know what the Bible says what marriage is, right? So I'm not going to be deceived by that. But look at Exodus 22, verse 16, just to show you. It says here, If a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely and 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 thou and endow her to be sorry endow her to be his wife so the law was here that if a man commits fornication with a woman that he should you know go and, and do what he can to get married to this woman he should be driven to marry that woman i mean these are good laws i think these are excellent laws right look at verse number 17 if her father utterly refused to give her unto him he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins all right so what else do we notice here? That the father, the government's given the father authority to tell his daughter, I don't want you marrying that guy. So even though she may commit fornication with a man, and yeah, the right thing is for that man to take her as his wife, okay? But let's say he's a complete bum, like a complete loser, and dad goes, you know what? Yeah, okay, you may, yeah, yeah, okay, you've done wrong. But that man, I don't want you to marry that man. He's not gonna look after you. Well, the father had authority has authority, and I believe he should still have authority, to tell his daughter, no, that guy's going to ruin your life. Yeah. And that man should still pay a dowry, you know, as though he was going to marry uh, that woman, because he's defiled her, okay? But I just want to show you, I'm not going to go through all the laws here, but I'm going to show you that government has been given the power to authorize marriage and also divorce, because remember, when, when someone was to get divorced, they were to give, give a bill of divorcement. That's a, a legal paperwork, right? You know, something's meant to be documented, that bill of divorcement. Anyway, Exodus 22, please. Exodus, oh, you're there. Exodus 22, verse 25. Exodus 22, verse 25. What other powers has God given governing authorities? It says here, If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by... Uh, by that the sun goeth down, for that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin, wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me, that I will hear, for I am gracious. What else do we learn? That government's been given the authority to govern over loans and repayments. Loans and repayments. Okay. Now God says, you know, if there's a poor person and he needs a loan, don't give him money and charge him interest. Okay, that is ungodly. In fact, we can see other passages that none of the Israelites were to charge each other uh, usury. Okay, because God sees that as you're taking advantage of, you know, people in your land. And so, you know what, Australians, unfortunately, when you take a loan out of the bank, they're going to charge you usury, right? They, they don't love Australians. It's, you know, they, they're trying to take advantage of you. Unfortunately, we live, in, again, in a corrupt system. But anyway, we see that the government has been given power over loans and repayments. And what we see there, that if there's a poor person, and you know, you should give to the poor. Again, Australia, we only have poor people. <laughs> like in Australia, you have to want to be poor to be poor. <laughs> anyway, um, but you know, you know, you might take his coat as collateral. You know, back then, you know, clothing was really expensive. And so, you know, you might say, well, you know, the person requiring the law might say, look, you can hold my coat as, as a guarantee that I'm going to pay you back. But it says here that if that coat is all that he has, like if that's what's keeping him warm at night to sleep, well, make sure that by, before, before, yeah, before night that you return that coat to him so he can at least sleep in it, and then the next morning he can give it back to you as collateral, okay? So God cares. Of course, God cares for the poor, right? He wants to make sure that things are done decently and in order. Now, can you please, uh, let's, you're in Exodus. Let's go to Exodus 21. Exodus 21, just one chapter back. Exodus chapter 21 and verse number 2. And I've preached on this very recently. But God has also given government power over employment, like workplaces, okay? There is some power over that. In Exodus 21, verse 2, If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. I have preached on this recently. So this is not slavery, but God is saying, look, if you're going to buy, if you're going to employ someone, if someone's going to be under your employment, you know, the contract, the longest contract you can have them for is six years, and on the seventh year, you've got to let them go free. Okay, that's not slavery. Now look at verse number 16, same chapter. 
Exodus 21, verse 16, because people, like I said, people take that, what we just read, and say, see, God's in favor for slavery. Just stupidity. But you look at verse number 16, it says, and he that stealeth a man and selleth him, hey, that's slavery. <laughs> you steal someone, you kidnap someone, and you sell that person. It says here, or if he, fa- if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. What's the punishment for slavery? The death penalty. You steal someone and you sell that person, okay? Sex traffickers, all right? They are to be put to death. Anyone that takes someone kidnaps anybody. You know, slavery, they are to be put to death. Okay, so God is definitely against slavery. What we saw in Exodus 21 verse 2 is just a relationship, you know, between an employer and the employee. God wants to make sure that an employer does not, you know, uh, abuse, you know, uh, the employee and turn him into a slave. Okay, six years is the maximum time, then you've got to let them go. Okay. Anyway, so we see that governing authorities has power over, you know, how you are to have relationships and contracts and agreements between masters and servants. All right. Can you please now go to uh, the book of Numbers? Numbers chapter 1 and verse number 1. Numbers chapter 1 and verse number 1. And this one's straightforward, but I'd just like to see you read it in the Bible with me. Numbers chapter 1 and verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. The next power that we see that government has is to raise an army. Okay, and an army should be for the purpose of self-defense, by the way. But we see that God does give the power you know, to raise an army. Now, what, what's wonderful about God's laws is that, you know, it, because many wars that we have fought are just wars we really should not have gotten involved in. I mean, I don't know how many righteous wars there have been, but a lot of these wars in the Middle East, they've not been righteous wars. I mean, it is obvious that, that, you know, uh, the the U.S. have sent their armies, their their, their power in there to take the resources, to take the oil, to take the wealth of those nations and installed their own governments in place for the people, no, for themselves, (laughs) for themselves, you know. Let's not let deceive ourselves. We live in a wicked world. Just accept the fact that many wars that we've entered into as a nation, you know, as an ally to the United States, has been to take the resources of foreign people. Now, what's wonderful, and listen, any time you send an army to war, you're going to lose people. You know, mothers sending their sons to war, not knowing if they're going to come back. You know, what, what a dreadful thing. And, you know, and what's wonderful about God's law He says here, look, if we're going to fight, if we're going to raise an army, every family has to get involved. Every family. That means you can't have some corrupt politician who's going to make billions of dollars, you know, send other people's children. Hey, he's got to volunteer his own family, his own children to go fight the war. And of course, that's going to make things right. You're going to question, should this be a war that we get ourselves into or not? You know, if all, everybody was involved, you're not just taking people and just sending them there and you're just racking, rake, you know, raking in the money, you know, that you take out of, out of warfare. So we see, uh, we see here that God has power, oh, sorry, he's given government power to raise an army. Now again, <clears throat> all of these things that we've looked at, I'm not saying that our nation is doing these things perfectly. In fact, what I'm telling you is they abuse their powers, Okay. But it is a power that God has given them. And so because God has given them those powers, they are accountable to God. Don't forget what we've covered from the very beginning. God is over all institutions, over all powers, over all authorities. And so when our government, when our politicians abuse their power, they're going to be judged by God. Just, just, I know it's uncomfortable for us. It's hard to, listen, I don't even... I'm not saying you have to agree with how they do things. I don't agree with how they do things. But I honor the power that they have. And I recognize God's going to judge you. And I'm at peace. I'm, I rest with that. I rest knowing God will bring swift judgment upon those people and upon the wickedness of the nation. We see this as we're going through the book of Jeremiah as well. 
Okay. Now, please go to Leviticus 13. Leviticus 13. And this is the one that's going to be the most unpopular. Okay. And it's because it's, it's, we, st we still have this pandemic, or pandemic, as Brother uh, Anthony likes to call it. The pandemic or the pandemic, whatever you want to call it, whatever it is, I don't know. But what we've seen, and not just in our country, but across this world, we've seen governments enforce quarantine measures, right, of all sorts. And before we read this, let me just say to you, I'm not in agreement with it all. Okay? Just because I follow what is being asked does not mean I agree. And I think it's wonderful. I do not think that at all, brethren. Okay? It bothers me. Okay? At the beginning, it bothered my conscience. But I'll, we'll get to that soon. We'll get to that soon. About your conscience. Okay? But in Leviticus 13, verse 4, I'll just read a quick passage here. It says, If the bright spot be white in the skin of his flesh, and in and in sight be not deeper than the skin, and the hair thereof be not turned white, then the priest shall shut him up that have the plague seven days. Shut him up for seven days. What is that? It's quarantine. This guy with, with leprosy, or what is presumed to be leprosy, has been shut up for a period of time. And when you can... You know, let's keep going. Verse number five. And the priest shall look on him the seventh day, and behold, if the plague in his sight be at a stay and the plague spread not in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up seven days more. So he gets checked again seven days later. He's still got that spot on his skin. All right, you're going to be quarantined for another seven days, for 14 days. A lot of the quarantine measures that we're seeing in our nation are about 14 days. You know, if, if I wanted to go to Queensland right now, I would have to, because I'm in Sydney, I, I cross the border, I have to be self-quarantined for 14 days. You can still kind of see where they get this idea from, because we, there is a biblical principle here. But what would we learn here? We learn that quarantine, whether we like it or not, brethren, is a power that God has given, you know, uh, governing authorities to govern over Israel, okay? His nation, okay, that he's set in place. And I, for one, believe all of these things are for good intentions. All of these things were to, to be good for the nation, all right? But do governments abuse their power? Absolutely they do, all right? Let's go to Leviticus 14. Actually, no, don't worry about that. Don't worry about going to Leviticus 14. I'll cover that uh, on probably Sunday afternoon. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 9 in the New Testament. Let me just go through those powers that God has given governments. And may, look, I might be missing a couple. Again, I've just gone through very quickly for the books of Moses. And I just wanted to take sort of the main things that we're familiar with. Let me just go through them once again. Number one, they were to punish criminals, uh, to authorize marriage and divorce, uh, loans and repayments. They were there to raise an army, to manage masters and servants, the power to quarantine. Now, if we look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 8, one thing that is very obvious as you read the books of Moses is that the nation of Israel, the governing authorities also had power over the tabernacle, the temple, okay? And how things were to be done, you know, in accordance to God's ways. Now, this is something that has changed in our days. If you look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 8, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 8, and so the fact that God gave these laws to govern how religious uh, customs and, and, and procedures were to be done was for that nation of Israel during Old Testament times. But in Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 8, it says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. What's the first tabernacle? That's the tabernacle that Moses was you know, instructed to build. Say so we know that in the Old Testament days. Look at verse number 9. For the men that came on Friday to uh, get some Bible study. It says, which was a figure for the time then present. What, do we, what did I call that? In the, in the, what? The types, right? So it's a type. It's a figure. Of time present. Uh, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. So we know the gifts and the sacrifices being there, referring to the tabernacle, the worship, the temple worship of God, that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Of course, the time of Reformation is when Christ came and brought in the New Testament. 
And so while you know, God gave the power to Israel to govern over these things, all of that changed in the New Testament when Christ uh, uh, passed, uh, died. Uh, look at verse number, verse number 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And so we learn a few things there, and we see how, you know, everything that was practiced in the Old Testament, when it came to the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the washings, all those things were just a type to point us unto Christ. It was just there to picture, it was a figure, so they could learn about what Jesus Christ would ultimately do when the New Testament came into place. But uh, the reason I wanted to cover that is, God did give governing authorities power over the religious practices of Israel, okay? But that's been done away with, okay? And governments today, because that's been done away with, governments today should not be enforcing uh, a religious, you know, uh, like, you know, our government should not be a government that forces you to convert to Roman Catholicism or something like that, right? It shouldn't be a government that forces you to convert to Islam or something like that. Like, it's something that's been forced by the government. This thing was specific for the physical nation of Israel, but we saw that, that that's been done away with in Christ, okay? Let's keep going. Now, let's turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. We learn, listen, don't forget... We read the first five books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Don't forget why they were written. Don't forget, okay? It's to show us how God wanted a nation to be governed, to teach us what was right and wrong. And when things went wrong in a nation, how they were to be addressed, how God thinks about certain things, okay? Does, has God changed? Does God change? Of course not. And so if we know if God was for the death penalty... All right, when Noah came off the ark and then when he introduced her with Moses, wouldn't he still be in favor of the death penalty today? Wouldn't he? God does not change. He doesn't change his mind. All right. Romans 13 verse 1. Romans 13 verse 1. And it just feels like, you know, it, it, in this day and age, especially because of the uh, pandemic, it just seems like Romans chapter 13 is a chapter that Christians today just don't like. All right, it, it's kind of like, uh, what's that chapter that the Jews don't like in Isaiah? 53. Sorry? 53. 50, oh yeah, Isaiah 53, where, where it talks about the, sacri- you know, the suffering of Christ. Okay? And the Jew, it's, it's almost like it's the forbidden, forbidden chapter of, of, his, of, of, uh, of Judaism. All right? well, it, it almost feels like Romans chapter 13 is the forbidden chapter of the New Testament church in 2020. That's just how I feel. It's like, what in the world? This is the Word of God. What's it say? And don't forget, this is a time, brethren, when Israel was, had been taken over by the Roman Empire. A wicked government that worshipped false gods, that prohibited God's people from, from practicing the laws that God put on the land. And brethren, we have a wicked nation before us. Okay? It, we shouldn't be, like, confused. What do we do? You know, when, when this nation practices wicked, uh, brings in wicked laws, what do we do when they, when they restrict us? This shouldn't be confusing. We should just turn to Romans chapter 13 and say, well, God, what did you instruct your church in the book of Romans to do when they had a wicked government over them? That's all we should do, right? Just go to the Word of God. We, should, we don't have to just come up with our own ideas. We just go to God's Word. What do we do? Romans chapter 13, verse number 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Hey, this is a decently and in order series. The term ordained comes from the word order. This is how God puts order into a nation. He puts powers into place. This is not telling us that every politician is righteous. They're not righteous. It's not telling us that politicians do not rise in power out of corruption. They do rise in power out of corruption. But the institution of government is a power that God put into place. He did it for a purpose. Ordained of God. Verse number two. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance, the order of God, the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. 
Now, we know this cannot be damnation in hell. Okay? So this is damnation on this earth. If you resist the governing authorities which God put into place, you will bring yourself damnation on this life. Okay? This is serious business. Okay? This is serious business. I mean, I'm not... We're just reading the Word of God. This is what it says. Amen? That's what it says. Verse number 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. The same. The government. You know, if you do good, if you just follow what the government says, they're going to praise you. They're going to praise you. All right? Of the same. Look at verse number 4. For he... Who? The government is the minister of God. What's minister? Another way of saying that. The servant. You know, God put government in place to serve us. You know, the government put, uh, God put the Roman government empire in place to serve the people of the land, even though they were corrupt, even though they were wicked. That's why God put it there, to serve the people. Because God knows a wicked government is better than no government. That's what he knows, right? A wicked government is better than anarchy. Where people are just doing whatever they want. Otherwise, we end up back in Noah's day. And we, act, we actually are heading towards Noah's day once again. We are seeing our governments become corrupt. But hey, while they're here, it's there to punish evil. Do they sometimes punish evil, which God does not call evil? They do it all the time. They're corrupt. But don't forget, God is their master. God is in control. And he will judge them accordingly. Okay? Just, just believe that. If you just believe... You know, instead of getting worked up, oh man, the government again. Just say, God, deal with them. They're your people. You know, when I taught on family and I told the wives, wives, when your husband is not loving you, when he's not leading you, when he's not guiding you, when he's not being the man that you know God wants him to be, go to his boss. Go to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, can you please sort out my husband? Listen, when our government is wicked, you know what we do? We go to get on our knees, we bow our heads, and we say, God, can you please sort out our government? Can you please judge these wicked rulers, please? Yeah. And God, it's in your hands. It's in your hands. You know, and you've put this government, I see here, Lord, in Romans 13, you want me to follow. You want me to be at peace. And I'm going to do what I can, if it's not a sin, Lord, but you need to sort out the rest of it, right? Listen, me taking up a sign and protesting is not going to fix the government. God will fix the government. Getting on your knees and bowing your head and praying will do more to fix this wicked government than getting out there with signs. A lot more. You're going to God. And those are his servants. Those are his ministers. Verse number four. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. Now look at this. For he beareth not the sword in vain. What's a sword for? To kill people. Okay. You know what's saying here? That God, still in the New Testament, has given government the power to put people to death. Yep. That's, that's what God wants from the government, right? But they're not doing it. For he is a, the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, verse number 5 is really important. And, and I've had to sort of just meditate and think about verse number 5 for a long time. And if, if you've listened to my preaching, I, I often talk about how it's important for me to have a clear conscience. It's important for me to have a good conscience. Right? Whatever decision I make in my family, whatever decision I make in this church, you know, you may not agree with my decision. And that's fine. I don't care if you don't, if you don't agree. Okay? As long as I have a clear conscience before God. As long as I, you know, if I make a decision for this church and I, I've done it before the Lord with a good conscience and a clear conscience to serve Him, then it doesn't matter who I upset as far as man goes. I'm doing that as unto the Lord and I'm fine with that. I'm at, I'm at peace at that. Okay? And so the same mentality comes with our corrupt governments. I don't agree, brethren. I don't agree that we're limited. I wish every member of Blessed Our Baptist Church was here right now singing praises to God as one body. That's what I would love, brethren. I would love that more than anything. And I think when we can meet, once again, I'm going to shed some tears. Because I know that's what happened up in Queensland. When we were able to get all together, they were limited, but it was, the limit was enough to allow the whole church to be together. You know, I shed some tears because I was so excited to have everybody together, you know, singing praises to God and fellowshipping together. And I know the 15 people that we had, whatever it was, the limit was, was hard on everybody. I know it's hard on everybody, right? And then you get worked up and you get angry. And brethren, I get angry. I get angry and say, well, Lord, 
How is it that you can have, and not Lord, you know, well, Lord, yeah, Lord, I'm praying to you, Lord. How is it that this government can have tens of thousands of people at some football game and they cannot allow the people in the church to come and just praise you, Lord? Can you sort that out, Lord? Can you sort that out? Now, I can either just rebel. I can. Now, they've been given power over quarantine. Are they abusing their power? Absolutely. Please don't misunderstand me. Do you agree with what they're doing, Pastor Kevin? No, I'm not. How is it that you have a clear conscience then with the decisions that you take? Because I haven't forgotten that they're a minister of God. I haven't forgotten that God is the power over them and He's going to judge them in the right way, in the right time. Okay? So when you're conflicted with what the government is doing, this is where verse number 5 comes in. And let me tell you, it's a blessing. Verse number 5. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject. You must needs be subject. You must be subject, the Bible says. Well, the government tells you, with the power, at least with the powers that God has given them, just be subject to that. Why? Why? Not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For your own conscience, Paul is saying. Just be subject to the powers that God has given them. Even, and you keep going, we're not going to go through this whole chapter, even when they're corrupt, even when they're wicked. Just be subject within the powers that God has given them, okay? And you're going to have a clear conscience. And I do. I have a clear conscience. Now listen, if God is angry that we're limited in how many people can worship in this church, I know he's not angry at me. I know he's angry at the government. And I have a clear conscience. God, you sort them out in your time. That's how we deal with this, brethren. Every time we're in conflict, our conscience is at conflict. Seek to have a clear conscience. God, how is it that I can have a clear conscience? Well, wherefore, you must need to be subject. And what am I going to be subject to? At least, at very minimum, at least to the powers that God has given them, even if they're abusing their powers. The powers that God has... We've gone through some, some of the you know, laws of Moses. At least with those things, I'm going to be subject to those things. Otherwise... I could very well be bringing damnation upon myself or even to Blessed Hope Baptist Church if I don't comply. So it's not a fear of virus. It's not a fear of getting arrested and thrown in jail. Okay? That, that causes me in good conscience to comply. It's a fear of God. It's a fear of God. It's the desire to have a clear conscience and understand, God, I don't want damnation upon us as a people. Can you please sort them out? Your, it's your government. You put them over us. You know, you've allowed this virus to come and I don't know, wreck havoc over 2020. It's such a weird year, isn't it? Such a weird year. But brethren, I have a clear conscience. I want you to understand that. Okay? I want you to, and I want you to have a clear conscience. Think about this. You, know, you don't have to agree with me today. Just go back to your Bible. Read this in your own time at home. Just think about it. I want you to have a clear conscience. I don't want you to be constantly at conflict with yourself and how we do things you know, in light of a wicked government. The Bible tells us in Titus 3, 1, I'll just read it to you. Remember, Titus was a pastor, and Paul is instructing Titus as a pastor. He says, put them in mind. He's talking about the people in his church. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. You know, this is not unusual that we feel conflicted. It's not unusual that we feel like rebelling against the government. It's not unusual, okay? Even Titus's church... Okay, they had people that were not obeying the government. So Paul's telling Titus, hey, make sure you remind them to be subject to those powers. Okay. Can you please go to 1 Peter chapter 2? 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. The Bible reads in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. There it is again, ordinance coming from the word order. This is the decently and in order series. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. Who was the king in this day? Caesar. Oh, such a righteous man. I'm going to obey. That guy's wicked. That guy thinks he's a god. <laughs> These are the instructions of the word of God, brethren. As supreme. Verse number 14. As unto governors, that's the government, as unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Hey, who sends the governors? Who gave the government power? It's the Lord God. 
Think about that. Think about that. You know, it's hard for us to process, but that's why I'm also preaching for Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah is about to be judged by a wicked nation, the Babylonians. They're just as wicked as, as the Jews, right? And you can see how, how the Jews desire to fight against the Babylonians, and God says, you're going to lose. My judgment's coming down. Okay? But you, you could think, if you were in, living in that land in Judah, you could think, well, we've got to fight. Hey, we can't let out the Babylonians come here. They're a wicked people. They worship false gods. This can't be the judgment that's coming. And you can, you can see, I can understand if I was there, hey, man, maybe we should fight. You know? It's no different, brethren. You know? We see here, the Roman Empire was a wicked government, a wicked nation. But God gave them authority. God gave them power for His purposes. And Peter and Paul... He's telling the churches, hey, just submit. Submit to their ordinances. All right. Now, this uh, Sunday afternoon, Lord willing, if I continue this series, and I'm, I've got more to cover, but I'm going to talk about what happens if the government does not have powers and, and what if they try to enforce certain powers that God has not given them. So we'll deal with that later on, okay? Because I'm sure some questions will come in that area, but I plan to cover that Sunday afternoon. Now, can you please turn to Revelation chapter 5? Revelation chapter 5. governments, at least the institution, it's not a wicked institution, okay? It's to set law and order, all right? Though, of course, men within the governments can be very corrupt and very wicked, all right? But what's wonderful, brethren, is that we are Australians, yes, but not really. The Bible makes it very clear that we're strangers and pilgrims. We're sojourners in this land, okay? And we have, uh, uh, we, we, uh, there is a government that I have no problems obeying. I, I guess when I sin, I disobey that government. But of course, that is Jesus Christ, our King. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And in Revelation chapter 5, verse number 9, have a look at this. Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 9, it reads, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. And has redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Look at verse number 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. Amen. Brethren, there's coming a time when there's going to be a righteous government. Yes. And you and I are going to be governing. I don't know. I, I kind of want the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> it's nice. Maybe one of you guys can rule over Sydney. I don't know. If God gives me the Sunshine Coast, I'm happy. All right? <laughs> but wait, listen, the time's coming when you and I will finally experience what a righteous government is like and we'll be making the rules. We'll be the ones making decisions, judging things in accordance to God's word. Amen. Wonderful time's coming. Please go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 4. When is this time coming? Of course, this is coming in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Okay? Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 4 reads, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Brethren, how long are we going to live on this earth? I think the average Australian lives about 80 years. Average Australian, okay, about 80 years. Can you put up with 80 years of a corrupt government when you're going to get 1,000 years with a righteous government, with Jesus Christ being the head? Yeah. Listen, when, during that 1,000 years, you're going to forget these 80 years, or whatever it is. You're going to forget the coronavirus. They're going to forget all these frustrations that you have. And why is the government doing this? Why are they enforcing You're going to forget all about it. You're just going to be rejoicing in the 1,000 years, brethren, to enjoy, to see what, how God really intended a government to be ruling over the entire, not just Israel, the entire world, ruled by Jesus Christ. And so look, God's not against government. In fact, one day Christ will be the government. The Bible tells us the government will be upon his shoulder. You know, every, all, all power, all, all on this earth, every government over every nation will be on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing to look forward to. Now, uh, keep your finger there. Go to, Revel actually, go to Revelation 21. Go to Revelation 21. And also, if you can keep your finger there, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And go to Revelation 21. Keep your finger there, but then turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Because I just want to set your heart at peace and just recognize that 
government, the power of government, the institution is not wicked. It's not sinful. All right? And, you know, I kind of wish there was no government. <laughs> I kind of wish that a little bit. But then I read, you know, just read the Bible. Oh, yeah. It's just going to destroy the entire world. <laughs> it's just going to bring God's judgment very quickly like he destroyed in the times of Noah with the flood. But there's nothing wrong with it. And you know what? Not only are we going to see a righteous government for a thousand years, but even beyond that. You're in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 reads, Then cometh the end. This is the end of the millennium. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. What is it saying? Christ's kingdom is for a thousand years. At the end of this, he's going to deliver the kingdom, which is a governing authority, of course, to the Father. Okay? So the, the, the kingdom continues. Right? Now look at this, verse number 25. For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he have put all things under his feet. But when he saith, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. He says, look, all power we put under Christ. The exception to that would be the power that allows Christ to do that, which is the Father. The Father is the exception of that, right? The Father will not be under the authority of his Son. We've looked at this before. But look at verse number 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So what do we find here? That Jesus Christ is given the kingdom to the Father, and Christ himself will be subject to the Father in the new heavens and the new earth to come. Okay? This is, we've covered this again in the doctrine of the Trinity, how we've seen that Christ is subject to the Father, even in eternity. Not just when he was walking this earth, even into all eternity, he will be subject to the Father. Jesus Christ can be subject under government as well, the government of the Father, the kingdom of the Father. Okay? And we saw Jesus Christ, when he walked this earth 2,000 years ago, be subject to the authorities that were over him, both Jewish authorities and also the Roman authorities over him. So Christ is able to do these things, brethren. All right. Now, the reason I point that to you is because government continues into eternity. You're in Revelation 21. Let's go back to Revelation 21, verse number 1. So Christ rules for a thousand years, gives the kingdom to the Father. All right. All things are under the Father now, even Christ himself. Revelation 21, verse 1. And when that kingdom is given to the Father, we know he creates a new heaven and a new earth. It says here, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So when, God, when we have this eternal state, the new heaven and the new earth, the city of Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, you know, will come down to this earth. Let's drop down to verse number 23. It says here, And the city had no need of the sun. So it's talking about the same city, the new Jerusalem that comes down. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. But now look at verse number 24. And the nations... Hold on. What's going to happen in eternity? When God creates a new heaven and new earth, guess what's going to exist? Nations again. There are going to be nations again. I wonder how those nations are going to be governed. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Hey, is there government in eternity? In the new heavens and the new earth? Absolutely. God still divides his people into nations. I don't know how he's going to divide it, but we see he does. And over those nations, there are still kings. There are still authorities. And so, listen, brethren, you know, there's nothing wrong with government. You know, even in eternity, God has put it into place for whatever reason. It's just there. All right. And what we learn, we learn that, hey, if we serve God, the more we do for God, the more he can reward us. He's going to reward us in the millennium. God can also reward certain individuals to have powerful uh, positions of authority when God creates the new heavens and the new earth. Hey, you know, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, if you want to be great in his government, for all eternity, not just for a thousand years, but for all eternity. 
get busy for God. Get busy serving God. All right? And just understand, hey, God, you put a government in place. When they're wicked, I'm going to leave them in your hands, Lord. You know, in good conscience, I'm going to follow the things that you've asked them to do within their power. We'll deal with what happens if they're outside of their power later. But within their power, God, I'm going to do it. You can judge them. And Lord, I'm just going to serve you in the capacity that I have. Whatever it is, Lord, if it's the Roman Empire that takes over Australia and they restrict us in certain ways, Lord, I'm still going to try to serve you in the capacity that I have and where I can't serve you because of a wicked government. That's in your hands, Lord. I'm going to have a clear conscience. I'm going to be subject, subject under those authorities. Because they're your ministers, God. You put them in charge. So can you please deal with them? All right, so I hope that gives you something to think about. God loves government. God's given them that power, okay? And when we don't have government, things get out of hand very, very quickly. And you know what? Even with a wicked government, brethren, we are commanded to be subject unto them. Think about the, the powers, you know, you can, in your own time. I don't know if I covered it all. You know, just taking the major points that I could think about. You know, in your own time, if you're struggling with this idea, please just go back and read the first five, especially the, um, yeah, well, the first five books of, of uh, the Bible, you know, the laws of Moses, and just see how God, like what, what, what uh, power God has given uh, governing authorities. You'll notice that God has given them a lot of power, you know. Uh, I, I'm not for governments taking more power than what God's given them. I'm not for that at all, okay. But, hey, where God has given them power, even if they abuse it, I'm just going to honor that, and I'm going to be subject unto that with a clear conscience. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father,